Well, good morning, everyone. A little easier to find a seat in church to sit today than it was last week, eh? But what a wonderful time it was last week. Uh, have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 24, and as you turn there, let's bow our hearts together in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. We set this time aside during the busyness of our week to gather together at the feet of Jesus and be taught. Lord, I ask that by your spirit you would convince our hearts that we might say with conviction, Jesus is Lord. There is a Lord. There is a King who rules over everything. And it's not us. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Convince our hearts of this central truth of the Christian message. We pray this in your name. Amen. So back into Acts, right? We had a couple of weeks where we were tracking through the passion narratives in Matthew's gospel, and now we are in this last push through our series through Acts. It will be more than a year that we've taken, but I think it's been fruitful and profitable, hasn't it? This chapter in particular is timely in our run through Acts. Paul, in this moment, has been imprisoned for the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we've been moving along with him, you'll remember that he was arrested in the temple. He was then transported from the temple to the tribune. From the tribune, he went to the council. And then from the council, he was rescued from a murderous plot and brought before Felix. That's where we find ourselves today. Now, as Christie was reading through this chapter... Did you notice what the central issue is? Let me say it a different way. If you were reading the court transcripts from this trial and you had to reduce the charges to one point, what would it be? Look at verses 14 to 16. Paul says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law, and written in the prophets, verse 15, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a, say it out, resurrection of both the just and the unjust. See, friends, that is what's at stake in this trial, the truth of the resurrection. So here we are on the second Sunday after Easter. Now, Easter, if you want to get super technical in the liturgical calendar, it's not just a day, it's a season. Did you know that? It begins on Easter Sunday, and then it goes 50 days right through until, say it out, Pentecost. Well done. You guys all passed confirmation class. It's this season of 50 days when we particularly celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, and so we did not orchestrate that we would be preaching Acts 24 on this day. This is one of those moments where the Holy Spirit makes us look a lot smarter than we are. But we come to Acts chapter 24 and we see these charges pressed against Paul. That's the first thing we're going to look at is the charges. The second thing that we're going to see is Paul's defense. And then the third thing we're going to look at is the time Paul spent with Felix. And the question I want to set before you this morning is this. Do you believe in the resurrection? Or is the very thought of the resurrection an offense and an affront to you? Now look, we are Canadians, so we tend to be polite. We would never state anything so starkly as to say, well, I just deny the resurrection. Instead, we would more passively just live as though it were not true. A sort of functional denial. Let me, let me phrase the question another way to really get at it. Do you believe that there is more to life than just 80 years on the planet, going into the ground and becoming worm food? It's right at the heart of many of the ills in our society and our world today, this notion of what philosophers call nihilism. Are you familiar with nihilism? This functional belief that nothing is true, nothing is real, nothing is knowable, 
Nothing endures, nothing matters. That's nihilism. That is a life lived without the hope of the resurrection. Everyone says, well, I just, I live my own life as an individual. You know, I get 80 some years on the planet. I live from my own context. I assign my own meaning. I live my own experience. This is the heart of nihilism. Then I will die and that's it, period. And yet here in Acts 24, Paul stands before Felix. And to Felix and to us, he makes a defense for two things. Number one, he makes a defense for the existence of truth. That's a battleground for today. And the second thing that he defends is the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. Well, we know a little bit about this governor named Felix from first century Roman historian named Tacitus. Tacitus records outside of the Bible that Felix was a curious governor. He began his life as a slave and yet he ended up the governor over this province of Palestine. He was the governor through backroom intrigue. Not because of any particular skill or noteworthy ability, it was just because Felix's brother was really good friends with the emperor, Claudius. That's how politics works, right? And so Tacitus wrote of Felix and said this. He said that Felix exercised the power of a king with the heart of a slave. So in other words, Felix was known to be a small man who never grew into his position. Now, often, we find ourselves frustrated because in life, we find ourselves with more responsibility than authority. You know what I mean by that? If you think about different jobs that you've held sometimes and you've found the most frustrating moments, it's because you've been granted this broad scope of responsibility, but you don't have the authority to actually make it happen. Or more pointedly, you've been given responsibility to manage people, but you don't have the authority to fire them. That's often the case. What we see in the life and in the governance of Felix is actually just the opposite. It's a man who had far more authority than character. And so look at verses 2 to 4. In verses 2 to 4, um, we see that Because of who he was, Felix was subject to the sort of flattery that attorneys like Tertullus set before him. You know, you read verses 2 to 4 and you just kind of like wince, right? Tertullus was this unashamed suck up. Well, let's jump right in and look at the charges that are brought against Paul. Look at verses 2 to 9. This is the prosecution's argument. Verses 2 to 4 is the initial flattery. Tertullus, the attorney, is talking to Felix and he says, Since since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, yada, 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 right? It's just disgusting. After verse 4, Tertullus then sets out to accuse Paul before Felix with three charges. We're going to take some time and unpack these because they apply today. The first charge is the charge of sedition. Do you know what I mean by sedition? Tertullus, on behalf of the Sanhedrin, is charging Paul with breaking Roman law, leading a rebellion. That's sedition. The second thing that Tertullus is going to charge him with is sectarianism. Do you know what I mean by sectarianism? So if if sedition is breaking Roman law, sectarianism is the accusation that Paul is now breaking religious Jewish law. He's starting a new sect, right? He's bringing a schism within the religion. Sedition, sectarianism, 
And then the third and final charge that Tertullus brings against Paul is sacrilege. So Tertullus is like hitting everything, right? He's, he accuses Paul of breaking Roman law, he accuses him of breaking Jewish law, and he accuses him of breaking God's law. Those are the three charges that he brings to bear. Look at verse 5. Here's the charge of sedition. For we have found this man to be a plague. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty brutal, isn't it? He stirs up riots among the Jews throughout the world. That's sedition. He's accused of sectarianism. The rest of verse 5 say that he is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Verse 6, sacrilege. He even tried to profane the temple. Now, verse 8 tells us that these vague charges have been brought before Felix against Paul um, without any evidence. In verse 9, we're told that um, the Jews pile on. You know, that, that is how false accusations work. We're going we're to get into these in a second, but I just want to say this. False accusations usually follow this exact pattern. The person bringing false allegations will fling a whole bunch of them up against the wall to see which ones will stick. Just pile these accusations on and hope that one of them is going to take hold. The first thing about false allegations. The second thing we see in here is a pattern of false allegations. After the allegations themselves have been piled on, then other people are going to pile on as well. You know why they do that? They're just glad to see the momentum heading in a direction away from them. And so they see that someone is getting these false allegations brought to bear on them, and they're like, man, as long as it's not pointed at me, I'm in. That's what happens. Yet even in these three false charges against Paul, we see a grain of truth. And again, that's how false charges work. Even in false charges, there's an element of it that's true. If there wasn't, then these false allegations in any false allegations would just be tossed. You're like, well, that's ridiculous. They have to have a little element of truth to take hold. In fact, in some cases, the charges are actually true. They're accurate, but they're invalid. They are true, but they're based on wrong foundation and wrong assumption. And that's actually what we have here in these. And, and this is important, folks. We're going to spend time looking at these because it isn't just important to see that as false allegations against Paul to understand what's happening in Acts 24. It's important because this is programmatic for how false allegations against the gospel worked not only back then, but how they still work today. It's the exact same. So let's look at this first charge of sedition. Okay? Tertullus is charging Paul with leading a rebellion, sedition. And so from one perspective, it is actually true. Paul's gospel ministry is marked by seditious outcomes. If you read through his three missionary journeys, um, entire cities are flipped upside down. There is a seditious outcome to Paul's gospel ministry. There are very real political, social and economic implications to the gospel. There is sedition. That's where the accusation's true. But where is this accusation false? This accusation is accurate but invalid because the cities, the towns, the provinces, indeed the entire empire, needed to be flipped on their head. Okay, let's, let's make this a little uncomfortable. 
when a nation, when a province, when a city, when a town has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, then what the gospel brings to bear is a good insurgency. Look, sedition, that word itself implies a rebellion, an attempt to overthrow something that's good. And yet when the gospel comes from Paul to the known world at the time, it comes as the good. It is not seditious because it is evil or it is bad. Instead, it's good news. And good news will always be seditious or rebellious when it comes to tyranny and godlessness. It'll flip tyranny and godlessness on its head. And the accusation against the gospel will be, well, that's sedition, that's rebellion. The gospel is inherently rebellious. For a Christian man or woman living in a secular, pagan, satanic, God-forsaken land, it will appear rebellious. And so this charge against Paul of sedition is both a yes and a no. Okay, how does that apply today? Well, I um, look at my own life and I look at those of friends around me, and I see that Christians often find themselves at odds with the world. This is increasingly true. I've noticed that actually in my lifetime there's been a radical change. So when I was younger, um, it was sort of cool to be a rebel, right? And rebellion back then meant like rage against the machine. I won't do what you tell me. That's what rebellion looked like back then. Rebels were people who lived countercultural lives. They, they rejected the nuclear family. They charted a path against the flow of society. But something's changed. Because those things that were rebellious and seditious before are now the norm. They are the ruling ideals. And so the gospel comes to today's radically changed, God-forsaken world and says, look, if you're going to follow the gospel, you're going to find yourself being accused of sedition. You're going to look like a rebel and someone who is countercultural. Okay, let me, let me make it more pointed. If in today's world you want to be countercultural, finish school. Get a job. Get married to one person, young and for life. Foster a God-fearing, Jesus-loving family. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, that's what open rebellion and sedition looks like today. Just like it was back in Paul's day. The gospel is seditious in a godless land. The gospel undermines and stands against the system when the system has been given over to man and to the prince of the power of the air, the God who is at work in this world. What does that mean for you and me as, as Christians today? Well, it means that we ought to commit small acts of sedition all the time. Get saved. Trust in Jesus. Go to church. Love and take responsibility for yourself and for your family. Be a Christian. And you will be accused of sedition and rebellion. Verse 5, the culture all around you will tell you that you are a pest, you're a plague, you're a pariah. Look, faithfulness ultimately is to the Lord our God. And the scriptures are clear that Christian men and women ought to look for ways to submit to the governing authorities because they are also God's ministers to us. But when the governing authorities require something of you that would require you to 
be unfaithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, then they've overstepped their bounds. And that's when you say, I cannot go there. I have a Lord, and he demands my allegiance and obedience. So Paul is accused of sedition and rebellion. In the one case, it's not true. But on the other hand, it is true, because the gospel results in rebellion and sedition against a godless society and system. Are you with me so far? Okay, the second, the second charge is sectarianism. Look at verse 5, the second half of verse 5. Paul's accused of being a ringleader of a disparaged group of extremists, these Nazarenes. Now, I think if you ask Paul directly, are you the ringleader? He would say, no. See, I'm, I'm a spokesman. Right? I speak on behalf of the ringleader, but the ringleader is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who leads the charge. And he leads his army on a surprising mission. It's a mission that actually shatters this image of Jesus meek and mild. Our ringleader, Jesus Christ, actually gave an answer to the charge of sectarianism and being schismatic bringing division. So is Paul actually sectarian? Is he divisive in his gospel ministry? Well, Jesus, the ringleader, would say, you bet. Back in Matthew chapter 10, this is what Jesus said. Now, now brace yourself. This is shocking, but I'm not making this up. This is Jesus. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Friends, the implication of the gospel is seditious and rebellious in a godless land. The living out of the gospel is sectarian and brings division. Even within families. And so these two charges against Paul, on the one hand, they're trumped up, but on the other hand, they're true. Can you think of examples today when the gospel brings division? We like to think about the gospel bringing people together, and certainly it does, right? Here's a church, people from all different backgrounds and socioeconomics, and people who would never otherwise be together, and here we are together in Christ. But what are some examples where the gospel has brought division and sectarianism? Well, this is right in the very DNA of our church here at St. George's. It was back in 2008 that our church voted to leave the Anglican Church of Canada. We were the third church in Canada to do so. And back then, you know, we were accused of being schismatic, sectarian, but we believe that the truth of the gospel demanded nothing less. And that was an example where a commitment to truth, a commitment to the gospel, didn't bring peace, but brought division. Well, that's what Paul's being accused of here, too. Look, let me ask you this question. Is there enough of a commitment to truth in your life that someone would ever accuse you of sectarianism? If you've never been accused of being divisive, never, ever, ever, then perhaps you're just going along with things instead of standing for truth. Good to get along. 
but never at the expense of the gospel. So sedition, sectarianism. The third charge is sacrilege. Paul's accused of desecrating the temple by bringing a Gentile in. You remember back in chapter 21, you remember the guy's name? Trophimus of Ephesus. Paul had just returned back to Jerusalem after his third missionary journey. He purified himself. He prepared himself. He then took Trophimus the Ephesian with him to the temple. But he left Trophimus outside in the court of the Gentiles. But he was accused of desecrating the temple by bringing him right in. Now, again, the accusation is both true and false. It's false because Paul never physically brought Trophimus into the temple, into the place where he shouldn't bring him. But in a deeper sense, it's true because Paul did bring Trophimus right into the very reconciled presence of God. You've got to remember that Paul was commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to be the apostle to the Gentiles, to bring foreigners to God. To, through repentance and faith, see Gentiles united to Christ, born again and saved. To see the chasm between God and Gentiles permanently closed. And so, this accusation of sacrilege is also accurate but invalid. Paul is being accused of bringing Trophimus into the temple. And you know that strikes right at the heart of the gospel. See, here's the irony. These guys who are bringing the charges against Paul, they saw something, but they didn't get it. Trophimus was figuratively brought into the temple. Because the temple is the Lord Jesus Christ. And what they missed was that he should have been. These religious leaders wanted Paul dead. They wanted to put an end to the trouble that he was creating for them. They they justified their actions because they thought, this Paul guy, he's so wicked that the end of getting rid of him justifies the use of any means. And so... They pile on all these charges against him, even though they know that they're not true. Look at verse 9. And then the Jews pile on too. But under God's sovereign hand, even though these leaders of the Sanhedrin are bringing what they believe to be false charges against Paul, These are captured in Scripture so that we can see that these are the normative ways that the gospel lives out in a pagan, secular world. If you are committed to the gospel, you will be accused of sedition. You will be accused of being divisive and sectarian. And you'll be accused of being sacrilegious by the ungodly. Why is that? Well, you know, it's because the central claim of Christianity is that Jesus is Lord. And a rebellious, divisive claim it is in the face of those who claim that there is no God or claim that they are their own Lord and God. That's why Paul's message was offensive to the religious leaders who had led so many astray. So those are the charges that are brought to bear against Paul. Let's look quickly at verses 10 to 21 in Paul's defense. Paul follows the pattern of Tertullus and begins with some flattery, buttering him up. He then points out that the accusations have no backing. Verses 14 to 15, Paul skips right over all the accusations and says his piece. He seizes this as an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. Verse 15, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, 
that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Paul seizes this as an opportunity not to defend himself, but to testify to the Lord Jesus Christ and his triumph over death. This is a commitment that I made probably several years ago. Our church was thrust into a lot of media spotlight many, around 2008, um, and I had to do all kinds of interviews on television and on radio and a newspaper, and I found myself answering all these questions. And I resolved at that time that if I was ever given a microphone or a platform, that I would always tell people about Jesus. It didn't matter what the question was, right? If they were asking me about the Anglican communion or about this or about that, like, yeah, 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 let me tell you about Jesus. And perhaps you might want to consider the same thing. Verse 16, do you want a clear conscience before God and man? Then discharge your duty to God and to your fellow man by warning them about the coming judgment and calling them to Christ. Verse 15 closes with this statement, there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Okay, this one's really going to pinch. You ready? This simple statement body checks what some theologians would call hopeful universalism or nuanced nihilism. Here's what I mean. Sometimes we would like to think that everyone dies, but then the righteous alone are raised to new life, while the ungodly simply cease to exist or are annihilated. That's what we'd like to believe. Hopeful universalism, nuanced nihilism. The righteous are raised to new life. Those who are ungodly, they just sort of cease to exist and perish and annihilate. That's not the biblical witness. Here, Paul reinforces this biblical picture that every single person will be resurrected. The godly and the ungodly. Some will be raised to new life in Christ, and some will be raised to eternal damnation. The very weighty matter. When it comes to the resurrection of the dead, you're playing for all the marbles. Look at verses 17 to 21. Paul concludes his defense pointedly by saying, Everything all rides on this one claim. The resurrection of Jesus and our resurrection. Paul gives this, this point a center stage, and so let's just let's do that for a moment. Have you ever really given thought to the resurrection? Like real thought, not just passing thought like I say it in the creed and I, you know, come to church on Easter. Have you ever really thought about the resurrection of Jesus? It strikes me that far too many Christians have passively slipped into this limp-wristed Pascal's Wager type Christianity. You know what Pascal's Wager is? Pascal was a philosopher who said, I would rather believe that there is a God and a resurrection and find out in the end that there is not than not believe in God and the resurrection and find out that it's true. Well, that sounds pretty clever, doesn't it? That sounds pretty nuanced. But in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he says the exact opposite. Listen to this. Remember, when it comes to the resurrection, you're playing for all the marbles. Here's what Paul says. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. 
We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ. Whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. See, see, this is what Paul is saying. He's like, you can't take this passive, mamsy-pamsy, Pascalian wager approach to the resurrection. It's either true or it isn't. And if it isn't true and you believe in it, then you just wasted your one and only life. Oh, but Paul finishes with this statement. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. You see, it all rises and falls on this. Was the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead? If he was, then our hope is in him. He was a first fruits. If he was raised, then we too will be raised. If we fall asleep in Christ, we will be raised to new life in Christ for all of eternity. Our hope and our trust is in the resurrection. And that's Paul's defense. He says, you bring charges against me of rebellion, sedition, sectarianism, divisiveness, and sacrilege. But none of them are true because Jesus has been raised from the dead. He is Lord and Master and King. I serve him. That's what he's saying. Okay, close with verses 22 to 27. So Paul gives this defense of the resurrection. And then he goes on to spend how many years with Felix? What does it say? Two years. It's a long time. And Felix would call Paul into his court regularly. It was like, uh, I don't know, he just, for entertainment or something, right? He wanted to hear from him. But one of the greatest tragedies in Acts is captured right here. Felix heard Paul's witness and testimony to the resurrection of Jesus for two years. And we're never told that he repented and accepted the Lord and was born again. We're not told anywhere that he actually believed in the resurrection. He died in his sin. Let that be a warning to each of us. How long have you been coming to church? How long have you been kicking around the Christian faith? How long have you been seeking, right? And just hovering. Two years like Felix? Ten years, twenty years, who knows? But even a day is too long. The question comes to you this morning through Paul's defense before Felix. What will you do with the resurrection of Jesus? Because, friends, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of all of those who will be raised. Now, if you're a Christian, you say, yeah, Jesus is Lord. He's raised from the dead. Scripture would say to you, flesh and blood have not revealed that to you. You didn't figure that out because you're particularly smart. The Holy Spirit revealed that to you. What does that mean? That means if you're in the Felix category this morning, you don't need more information. You have enough. You need to pray and ask God the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of Jesus to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the good news of the gospel and for your love for us in Jesus. Thank you for the truth and the hope of his resurrection that he was raised from the dead and so too will we be. 
Pray, God, this morning for all of those who are confronted with the truth of the resurrection and deciding in this moment, what will I do with that? Would you, by the power of your Spirit, grant them the faith to believe? To live lives where they put it all on the resurrection and let it ride. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.